About 20 years ago, scientists discovered that there was an aspartyl protease that was an essential enzyme to the replication of the HIV virus. And so immediately upon this discovery, this protein became the target of enzyme inhibition. If you were assigned the task to come up with an inhibitor of this enzyme, the first thing you'd want to know is what's the mechanism of the normal mode of action of aspartyl proteases. And so let's take a look at that here. Aspartyl proteases had long been known. They're actually enzymes that are found in the digestive system. They contain two aspartyl groups in the enzyme active site. That's why they're called aspartyl proteases. One of them is going to be protonated and serves as a general acid. The other will be unprotonated and can serve as a general base. Uh, because of their acidic groups, these aspartyl groups are quite acidic, they are able to function at low pH, and so that's why they're uh, capable of operating in the stomach where the pH can be quite low. And a prototypical example is the enzyme pepsin. The HIV protease is, consists of two chains. Each of them are about 99 kilodaltons in size, and one chain will deliver one aspartyl group, and the other chain will deliver the other aspartyl group into the active site that we're going to see in just a moment. Substrate specificity, it was known that the uh, HIV protease was particular at cleaving the peptide bond between an aromatic amino acid residue and proline. So here's the sessile bond that undergoes uh, fragmentation, undergoes cleavage in the uh, enzyme active site. Here's the aspartyl protease, uh, uh, the active site with the aspartyl protease on position 25 from one chain, and 25 prime that comes from the other chain. The, one of these aspartate groups is protonated, and the other one is unprotonated. So we've got the general base on the right, the general acid on the left. Water is going to add into this peptide bond, and so we're going to use the general base to activate that nucleophilic addition, and then we're going to use the general acid to protonate the oxygen of the carbonyl group. That creates what the, is a tetrahedral intermediate. That tetrahedral intermediate is actually going to have two hydroxyl groups. It's uh, uh, basically a dihydrate at that uh, tetrahedral carbon. And we've reversed the role now of these two aspartate groups. The one that was the acid has become the base. The one that was the base has become the acid. And so we're just going to turn around the electron flow, starting with the aspartate group that's the base, deprotonate, and then kick out, eliminate, in this beta elimination step, the proline carbon nitrogen bond. So that's the electron flow for that turned around step. This is actually the rate determining step. And so we're going to want to know what's the, in trying to think about an inhibitor, we're going to want to pay a lot of attention to the transition state structure for this rate determining step. That immediately yields the product. The product is um, going to be this uh, amino group, the carboxylic acid group of what used to be the peptide bond. The one aspartyl group has now become acidic again, and the other one has become basic, and so we have sort of the classical example of bifunctional catalysis. Let's take a look at the three-dimensional structure of the HIV protease. It's a fascinating structure. We'll see the two different protein chains are colored uh, differently in this space-filling model, and if we take a view where we spin this around, there's a side-on view, look at the front view, we can see that there's a cavity that is where the active site is, and this cavity goes all the way through from one side to the other. <clears throat> it's known that the way that uh, this active site binds its substrate is by having these two flaps uh, basically open up so they can uh, sort of uh, spring open and uh, collect the substrate, engulf it in the enzyme active site, and subject it to catalysis. Let's take a look at how the substrate binds and where those aspartyl groups are. Here's, the, uh, here's a space filling model where you can see now the substrate in yellow and now a wireframe model that you can see that. And as we zoom in on this, we'll be able to see where those uh, aspartyl groups are. So let's look down here and we can see that there are the two aspartyl groups. They're basically dangling right into the carbonyl group of where the substrate is going to occupy. So we can put the substrate in place and there it is. The substrate is uh, shown in yellow. We see those two aspartyl groups 
uh, hanging into the carbonyl group of that peptide bond that undergoes fragmentation. You get an idea here, I think, of how this protein serves to both create that cavity that can bind the substrate to be able to recognize those two residues that it recognizes, but also to position, basically rigidly hold, those aspartyl groups in place. Here's another view. We can spin this around. There's a side view. There's a side view. We can keep going and you can get back around and you can see those two groups hanging right in that carbonyl of, the, uh, of that yellow substrate molecule. That substrate's actually an inhibitor. The inhibitor that was discovered uh, is going to be shown here on this slide. But let's look at that transition state for that rate determining step because really that's what we're trying to mimic. We're going to come up with a reversible inhibitor of this aspartyl protease. And in trying to think about what the enzyme is doing, what it's binding most tightly, is the uh, transition state lead in the rate determining step. And so we can take a look at what that transition state looks like by thinking about the electron flow arrows for how that uh, dihydrate breaks down. And so we can see that there's going to be a diminishing negative charge there, developing negative charge over here. The key thing is, is that we can see that there should be some tetrahedral bond with hydroxyl groups on them, and the proline should be uh, nearby. And so as scientists thought about coming up with an inhibitor, they really wanted to create something that mimicked this geometry, but had a lot greater stability so that it couldn't break down. And that's exactly what they produced when they came up with the molecule that had the name JG365. The structure of JG365 is shown over here, and a couple of key things that JG 365 has going for it is, first of all, rather than having a nitrogen in this position, which would be a good leaving group and could be protonated by the general acid, it has a CH2 group. And so this bond becomes, this carbon-carbon bond, becomes completely stable and is unable to undergo the normal bond breaking step through the general base catalyzed beta elimination process. That's one thing it has going for it. And also, it's got the basic mimicking of the tetrahedral geometry, the te that uh, tetrahedral geometry that's found in the transition state structure. And so the JG365 is effective because it's stable to hydrolysis and it has the geometry of that transition state structure. So if you do a superposition, we can imagine how this molecule is going to. Uh, basically be superimposable directly on the transition state structure that we have uh, drawn for you here. The only difference is in this CH2 group that connects to the proline, which is provided, that CH2 group is provided because it gives that stable bond. So that was a solution to the problem. It binds quite tightly. 0.66 no nanomolar is the dissociation constant, and so this turned out to be quite an effective inhibitor of the HIV virus.